let's talk a little bit about um, the various choices that we've had, maybe some historic and some uh, pertinent to, to, to modern times. But just in terms of the mechanism of action, you've mentioned a couple of the cytokines, IL-2, gamma interferon. H how are they um, helping the immune system uh, to fight cancer? So, um, in, you know, in, in, in general, um, we don't fully understand interleukin-2. Uh, IL-2 is uh, approved for the treatment of metastatic uh, melanoma and renal cell carcinoma, and there's no question it can lead to durable responses. And uh, now that we've had a chance to follow patients for 15, even 20 years, these, these probably are really cures uh, in these patients. We think that the main way that IL-2 works is it really acts as a T cell growth factor. There are IL-2 receptors on the surface of T cells, and it leads to their growth and pro proliferation. And when you have an effector T cell that can recognize the melanoma cell or kidney cancer cell, you get a good response. I think the, the kind of dual-edged nature of IL-2 is that it also activates uh, what cells that are called regulatory T cells. And these regulatory T cells also contain IL-2 receptors and can expand up, and they actually block immune responses. We don't really understand why in some patients those effector cells will be preferentially expanded and in some patients, the regulatory cells will expand. But there's a lot of research going on now to really try to understand that, to try to block the regulatory cells and really let IL-2 work on um, the, the effector cells. Other cytokines in development, for example, interleukin-15, seem to be more preferential for those effector cells, for the memory cells, the kind of cells we want to see to eradicate a tumor. And so that's going to uh, be interesting as this is being uh, tested in many clinical trials right now. John, the, um, you know, the, probably the most exciting agents we've seen across a number of solid tumors have been the monoclonal antibodies mm -hmm. to a specific target, CTLA-4, right. uh, PD-1 or PDL one yeah. Talk us through the monoclonal antibody and, and, and what's going on there. Sure. You know, so, so this work is really probably the single biggest breakthrough, I think, that has led to immunotherapy being a modality that we consider a standard now just in the last uh, couple of years. So it had been observed that very often T cells could be present, but were being inhibited from fighting the cancer, and it wasn't understood for a long time why that was happening. Um, you know, now as Howard mentioned, you have different types of T cells. You have T regulatory cells that we think you know help keep the brakes on, and T effector cells that do the heavy lifting in killing T cells. Um, it was uh, it was finally understood, and, and Jim Allison was one of the pioneers, and a lot of others have contributed to this. Uh, that there were things that were inhibiting T cells from, uh, uh, from doing their work. Uh, and we now call these the checkpoint factors. Um, and so what checkpoint inhibition means is that uh, a T cell interacts with a, a ligand, and there's a receptor on the T cell that would have, for example, PD-1, uh, and then uh, on uh, an antigen-presenting cell or a cancer cell, there would be its ligand PD-L1 or PD-L2. And when those two interacted, that would stop the cell from attacking. Now, likewise, the, the first one discovered was CTLA-4. And by blocking this, and the first monoclonal antibody that, that was clinically approved for this is called ipilimumab. So ipilimumab uh, blocks CTLA-4. It essentially took the brakes off the immune system, and it got those T cells uh, attacking whatever its target was once again. Now, this is a system that's normally in place to help prevent the immune system from becoming overzealous, from keeping uh, things like you know, autoimmune reactivity at, at a minimum. So it's not surprising that one of the consequences to taking the brakes off is you do have an increase in autoimmune uh, consequences, and we see that in, in a variety of different ways. Um, but this is the concept now, first with CTLA-4, that, that blocking that enhanced tumor responses. Then PD-1 or PDL one uh, blocking either one of those. Uh, you know, and now we have a long list of other uh, uh, checkpoint factors that are potential targets. And so in, in upcoming years, we're going to see a lot of different drugs uh, blocking those others. But really, CTLA-4 and uh, PD-1, PDL one axis are, are the two that are the cornerstones for what we're doing right now. And Howard, um, um, tell us briefly your perspective on therapeutic vaccines and, and how they may play a role. So I think, you know, a lot of the core of, of how T cells work are, are they're really designed to recognize an antigen. And so the concept of vaccination is that if you knew what the antigen is that the T cell is seeing, you could simply immunize the patient and get an immune response to it. 
And while I think that makes sense, I don't think we really understood all of the other factors that can influence the T cell response. And the success of the, the checkpoint inhibitors, of course, is, is, has really put them front and center in the field. One of the interesting findings in some of this work has been that the um, mutation burden may correlate with good response to these checkpoint inhibitors, and that suggests that with more mutations, there may be more antigens available. And so the idea that we could come back maybe with the vaccine and kind of um, help these responses along is, is gaining some momentum right now. I think we, the field suffers from a lot of negative vaccine studies that were done early on because I think we didn't really understand what was going on in the tumor microenvironment. And if you really look at some of the more carefully done trials, there was evidence that you could generate T cell responses with these vaccines, but probably when they get close to the tumor, they just were being suppressed or energized and really couldn't do their job. So I, I think we're gonna see more with vaccines in the, in the future, and you know, we'll have to put them into the clinic and test them to, to really see what their full potential is. Any hope of a patient having a customized vaccine? For their cancer? Well, I mean, it's a good, it's a good question. You know, the the idea is that um, if we could um, somehow uh, logistically figure out what mutations are in a given cancer, and so the developments in precision medicine, of course, are very interesting to us because you can now rapidly survey the you know the tumor genome and see what what's happening, and if we could develop a vaccine uh, approach that could target some of those new antigens it might be very interesting to see if that's not more effective. Um, so Steve Rosenberg has done some work recently trying to do that where he's been able to generate a T cell to one of these new antigens and of course is seeing regression in one patient yeah. so far. It's all you need for a start, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, as, as Howard's saying, it really, this is the interface of genomic medicine and, and the, the immune system. And, you know, you can imagine now that we're starting to get all this next generation sequencing data where we're identifying mutations in hundreds and hundreds of genes. What you'd love to be able to do is not only target mutations with things like tyrosine kinase inhibitors, but, you know, if you could say we predict this would be an antigen, this particular mutation, and you've got this HLA type, essentially take off the shelf T cells, you know, and give them to a, to a patient. And that is. Uh, I think that would have been pie in the sky, you know, five or ten years ago, but it really is, we're taking steps that make that a more and more concrete possibility in the near future.